Katie, how long have you known Alvin? I met Alvin probably when I was a young teenager. Didn't hunt with him until probably senior in high school, maybe. 17, 16. First time I ever got to hunt. First time he ever let me hunt with him. <laughs> That's the hard door to get into, isn't it? That first step uh, yeah. inside the the circle. Yeah. If you think that's bad, you ought to hear the guys complain from Merced. <laughs> <laughs> so where are you from, Alvin? I live in a little town west of Fresno. The name of it is Dos Palos. Oh, okay. And you've been doing this for quite a while. Well, I started when I was very young. I was, I moved into a, a, a neighborhood beside some people that I didn't know. And I was five years old and they said I was up on a barrel preaching. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they didn't have, they didn't have dogs at the time and neither. And I was only five, but in the near future, he got to, got into coon hunting. His name was Earl Bonds and he got into coon hunting. And when I got big enough to go with him, I started coon hunting with him, and I was probably eight or nine years old then. Yeah. And there it just escalated. I started, got my own dog when I was about 12. There's an old long-eared gossip, black and tan. When she walked, she'd drag the, her ears on the ground. <laughs> and very <laughs> worth it. <laughs> what anyway, was that dog's name? Gypsy. And that and was your first? That was my very first hound. And from there, it just got into coon hunting more. And, and as I grew older, got my driver's license. We got started cat hunting, bear hunting. Cat hunting was my main thing for a lot of years, the way I worked. I couldn't couldn't get away when bear season was going. I had to work. And just from there, it just went up. And in 1982... I quit my job and took over a, a store that my mom had been running that had. And from there on, I had lots of time to hunt. <laughs> what did lots you do of, before that? Bear. I was a, I worked for Anderson Clayton, which was a cotton gin company. I run a cotton gin for them. Oh, wow. And that took, that took, Took all the time in the fall when bear season opened, so did the cotton season. So winter time came, I cat hunted. We had real good cat hunting. Yeah. Uh, the tro problem with cat hunting was getting cat dogs. <laughs> <They were. laughs> That's still a problem all these years later, Alvin. <laughs> yeah, I know. It, it's been, it was tough, but we've managed and. Uh, we'd catch 30 to 50 cat a winter on the west side, which is dry country. It was hard hunting. And later years, I got where I could go bear hunting. I got acquainted with, uh, who was it? Stormy. Stormy Rowland. He introduced me to this country down here where Eddie lives now. Oh. And I got acquainted with uh, the hunters around here. We did a lot of guiding. For years, I guided for Eddie, and uh, we caught lots of bears. Yeah. Was it the same kind of dogs, or? You know what? The dogs has changed over the years. When when I was young, there was no no line of dogs that you could count on going and getting one and it amounting to anything. There was just a a dog that was good and would catch game just popped up out of nowhere every once in a while. There was no no special breeding or nothing then back them days. You just get lucky and come up with one that would would make something, but they wouldn't reproduce. Yeah, they they were just you know dogs, but they they made good varmint dogs. Yeah, yeah, that's. You know, guys today, I feel like don't realize the work that went in early on, especially out here on the West Coast. You know, the back east, there was always big competition 
you know, breeders and coon hunting was so big, but out here it's like, man, the fact that we can go and find a dog that comes from a line that produces pretty consistently now. I mean, that wasn't a thing back then without you guys doing that back then, there's no way we'd be where we are today. Well, uh, it's so hard. So many people wanted, they wanted, so many guys, they wanted to stick with a breed of dogs. And you couldn't do that. You had to stick with a type of dog. Yeah. That was, the type of dog was what caught the game. Not to, not them walkers. Walkers back when I was a young man, they were very unpopular. They wouldn't, they wouldn't even tree most of them. They, it took a long time for the walkers to, to come into the hunting world and be successful. But, uh, you had to stay with the right type of dog, no matter if it was a black and tan or a blue tick or whatever. Yeah. And, and that's what uh, has gradually turned into a, a group of dogs that will tree game and they're still available today if you know where to go. Uh, I, got a, I got a friend that lives in Merced. That's why I said that a while ago. Uh, he started off with back in the 80s with a, little Finley River bred female and her name was Sadie and he started breeding her and she made a terrific bear dog yeah. and her offspring was good bear dogs and right on down the line and uh, he's still breeding that same breed of dogs today and other guys have picked up on it and, and they knew what kind of success he had with those dogs and there's other people got that that line of dogs now that are more successful with them than he is today because he's kind of let the breeding get away from it from his and not pay attention to what was uh, being bred. And, but there is that strain of dog still yet today. Yeah. Those dogs Jason. were pretty influential too, I think, all the way around out here. Because I know a lot of the guys that I started hunting with, some of the – best dogs that came off of it were off that Finley river. You know, they made some real big game dogs. Yeah. That Jason, the dogs that Alvin's talking about right now, basically is the beginning of what Cougar, everything Cougar has right now. So sure. The yeah. last one we dealt, we talked about in the last podcast, that's kind of where all these white dogs came from. What is the man that, that Alvin's talking about? That's them dogs. Gotcha. Well, then too, he had he had a friend that lived up in the mountains. His name was Charlie Coons, and he had a, a male out of Oklahoma he called Champ, and he had a little white dog that was more of that line of dogs. That uh, his name was Pepper, and they they bred, and that's where a lot of the dogs come from. Also, that Ralph claimed to be his bloodlines, but there was other people that had the had the same amount of bloodlines, same effect with the, that line of dogs. And today you can't you you can't hardly separate the two from being successful with the dog. But Charlie, Ralph's still alive and Charlie's dead. But uh, he had a lot to do with keeping that strain of dogs going. Yeah. So what type of dogs were they? I mean, these they're, they was walker dogs, but a lot of white with ticks and model ears. The ones that you really, really everybody went for was the ones with the model ears. <laughs> and they was ugly, but they was good. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's what. What do they call it? Um, some guys have called a calico ear. Is that what they call yeah. it to you? Model ears, calico, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, real distinctive. And those dogs that produced it, it seemed like that was a real dominant trait, too. Like, yeah. it showed up a lot on down the line. Yeah, that color and 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 trait there stayed with them for right on down the line for years. And like I said about those, those other young, there's a young guy up. The other side of Merced, but uh, Turlock somewhere up there. He's got into that strain of dogs. There was a there was a young dog out of directly out of that line of dogs that was floating around. And his name was Mohawk, and they bred him to just about every female 
they come in heat there for a year or two. And uh, there was a there was a bunch of them out of him, and and those guys up there, they're they're treating bears with those dogs just like they did in the old days. They're they're bear dogs, right? So what um, what is it that set those dogs apart? I mean, what was it that made him kind of stick with them over, you know, what everybody was trying to piece together? What was the hook? Well, they wasn't afraid of a bear. Yeah. So, so many dogs, you know, uh, they ever see a bear, then they start running behind or won't run them at all. So, but those was bear dogs. Yeah. Which, and they still are. That's the thing that I've tried to explain to a bunch of, you know, new hunters too, is there's a difference in a dog that runs a bear and a bear dog. You know, a bear dog is something to be seen. Yep. And they, and they don't have that fear. Them, them other dogs, they just, they naturally got the fear of a bear. And these dogs just, they get eat up and they go right back. They're, they're bear dogs. Yeah. So when did you start running the bears? Like when did you make that shift over from just coon hunting? Well, I was, the time you drove? I was probably 18, 19 years old. Got got a little older and had a little better dogs. Learned the country. I was I lived out in the valley. I never had been in the mountains that much before that and I learned my way around and and started hunting the mountains and started treeing bears. Yeah. Were there a lot of bears back then or was it hard not to find then, game? Not then there wasn't. There was there you had to look pretty hard. Sometimes you go on a weekend and you might hunt two or three weekends without ever finding a bear track. Oh really? Yeah, it, was, it was tough hunting back then. But then in 1966, the mountain lion started moving in. And we started I think Jason, uh, not Jason, uh, Cougar posted one of the very first lion I ever treed. And the the dog that treated it was his first one, too. And he was a little Oklahoma dog, just a little cur dog. And he he made probably one of the best cat dogs I ever owned. But he treated a lot of bear also. But that's, you know, you just... Back them days, you had to get lucky to, to come up with a good dog. They, 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 people nowadays keep eight, nine, ten dogs. Back then, you was lucky if you had one or, or two. Right. Yeah, so, you know, it's a, it's a lot different out there today than it was then. But I'm talking about in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Yeah. When did you see the population start booming? Like, the bear population? Yeah. Uh, really, it was really a slow progress. They didn't. Uh, they didn't really start building up. Not overnight. This it took a long time. Uh, I think what happened with a lot of it was there was a lot of outlaw hunters, and and a lot of them kind of faded out and got old, couldn't hunt, and and quit killing the bears. And I think that was the re- reason why they come made a big increase, and and it took it took a while for it to it take place. Yeah. Did you uh, did you like running the lions better than bears, or are you? You know, hunting? when I started out on the lion, I I made a point to, that I was going to try to tree a hundred, and I got so tired of driving and looking for line tracks i finally just i i went up to in the 80s but i finally just quit no i hated it i won't lie when i still was hunting i wouldn't hunt a line for nothing <laughs> i'm so sick of driving by the bear tracks and waiting to find a line track <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we, that's what you did most of the time yeah no that's you hear that a lot like the bear hunting you can't explain it to someone if they've never done it. Yeah. But there's something about it that just it hooks you. But in later years, like from eight, 82 on up, I hunted really, really hard. I treated a lot of bears, and I was blessed with some good dogs. Yeah. 
And you you just recently got out of dogs, right? Yeah, I I started going blind about oh uh, maybe eight nine years ago, and I finally got where I couldn't drive no more. I had to give up my driver's license, and so I just uh, made up my mind that there ain't no use keeping dogs if you can't take them to the mountains. So I just I just folded up about five six years ago. And that's why you keep Eddie around. He can drag you out every and once in a while. Tell me, well, they call me and tell me all their stories. It's just like being there almost. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was glad yeah. when uh, when Eddie said that we could get you on here because we've talked about you before in the podcast. And like I said, at Elk Creek, you know, it's always fun to go down in the corner there and sit around and you know, yeah. all you guys getting together with Sonny and swapping yeah. stories. It's always fun to hear. That's the reason I didn't go this last year to Elk Creek, though. I just, uh, so blind and I have to use a walker now. I can't, can't walk very far without one. And, and last year before last, I fell up there and messed myself up pretty good. I fell on a porch step going into a trailer. And so I just didn't make it this last year. Yeah. Well, so. The guys that you used to hunt with, I mean, do you stay in contact? Are there many still around? There are not many still around. I I have one friend in in Bakersfield, Ronald Huckabee. He's he's still alive and hunts a little bit. He's been he's older than I am, and uh, most of them most of them's gone. Yeah. But you know, I was always blessed. I don't know why, but I was always blessed with a younger hunter or two. Always seemed we always seemed to hook up, and I, I've been I hunted with a friend of mine that grew up with me uh, around me. His name was Randy Ballinger. When he gave it up, Lewis started hunting with me, and in the meantime, I got acquainted with Eddie and. And me and Lewis and Eddie, all we all hunted together right on down the line. We just uh, had a great time. <laughs> but the old guys are gone. Yeah. Well, that's why you got to keep Eddie around. <laughs> 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 so you guys are going to go get out and do some hunting while you're down yeah, there? Yeah, he's going to take me out in the morning. I haven't been in a long time. Yeah. How long has it been since you've been out? Oh, probably a year. I have another friend that uh, takes me once in a great while. Oh, good. Well, I mean, I've got a couple of questions. I mean, I'd like to hear some good stories, and Eddie's going to help me out on these because I'm sure he's got a, a pile of them from over the years. But I'd really like to hear when you made that shift to guiding and running lots of bears. I mean, what was it that you were looking for? Was it just the grit? No, you know, it takes money to hunt. <laughs> That's the <laughs> truth. And by me guiding, I could hunt more freely and not have to fight with my wife over filling my gas tank up. <laughs> How much was gas back then? <laughs> oh, it wasn't bad. It probably when it started coming up, the thing I only the price I remember was fifty cents a gallon, and but it got higher than that. It was a dollar and something, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> You're lucky you got out when you did. <laughs> I don't know what Eddie's paying, but I know what I'm paying, and it's ridiculous. Well, we're basically in the same kind of state right now, so you, your your gas can't be. Well, we got a little bit more tax, but it's. About the same. Yeah. Ridiculous. So how long did you guide for? Probably close to 20 years. Yeah. I I got my outfit 1993, and Alvin had been guiding a little bit for another guy for at least five years, don't you reckon, before that, Alvin? Yeah, quite a bit. Matter of fact, we'd be more than that, because actually me and Randy guided some. With him, that might no, no with, just oh, just you two, okay. Yeah. Maybe ten years ahead of that, so probably you know mid eighties. Uh, he would have started. 
Weren't you saying before, Eddie, that Elvin's guide license was like number four or is like one of the No, that was that's actually was Craig Morgan's. Craig Morgan had number two was his guide license. Alvin's was what was yours in the hundreds or a hundred? I, I don't even know. Alvin might have been just a tad bit of an outlaw at the beginning. I know he can't get in trouble now, but he <laughs> might have guided without a guide license for a year or two. <laughs> Statute of limitations is up. <laughs> yeah, it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if they want to take him over that, they're they're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> it was when you were guiding, like back then. I mean, I know what the guiding scene is like now. I mean, pretty much anyone with a checkbook can go on any hunt that they want. Were you getting a lot of like hunters from out of the area or was it just guys that wanted to go bear hunting? And No, we got them from out of state. Quite a few different out of staters. Were there good bears down there at that time? Uh, this this Springville country where, where Eddie lives, when I first started hunting this country, it wasn't it wasn't nothing at all to go out and catch a four or five hundred pound boar. Man, there's so many bear in this country. They had trails through the forest that you wouldn't believe, like walking down a sidewalk. Really, it was unbelievable. And nobody else had hunted this country for several years. And if you've seen it, you'd know why. It, <laughs> most people drive through it; it scared them to death. They, they say, well, I wouldn't even turn a dog loose in there. But if you had a good partner and you learned how to hunt it, it wasn't that bad. Yeah. So and his old buddy used to say a lot of stories. There's a place called Ant Creek that, that Alvin and Randy had both went through. And Randy, he was kind of a jokester. He always had a one-liner. And uh, he went through Ant Creek. I think it took him half the day or three-quarters of the day. And it was he, about an eight-hour walk. Eight-hour walk. Well, anyways, he come out without a shirt on, and uh, his line was, that's one of the all these canyons around here. Uh, 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 a boy goes in, comes out a man, and a man goes in, don't come out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's some rough country. It's hard to paint that picture for people, too. You know, like, I, I talk to a lot of guys that come out from the, the East Coast, and they just see what it's like out here on the west side. And I get that a lot, too. Even, you know, driving people around, they're like, man, I wouldn't even turn dogs loose in this. But if you wanted to catch the game, I mean, that's where it all was. Well, that's the way it was here. You know, you had to, to hunt a rough country or they or you wouldn't find no, no game. How were you starting them? Were you rigging dogs back then, driving around or looking for tracks? Yeah. No, I we had rig dogs. So Jason here is one thing I have to say, but Alvin taught me a lot about how to find bears. Yeah. And, you know, certain part of the year, the beginning of the year, you're hunting them in certain feeds and you're rigging them in a lot of those feeds. But certain times of the year, then bears get laid up in these big old canyons. And in our country, contrary to like a place in Oregon that you're used to hunting, is not ate up with roads. There's right. huge canyons that don't even have a road top or bottom to it. And when them bears get slowing down in them acorn, you know, acorn canyons, you had to walk on them a lot. So we left the truck a lot of times late in the year where we, we didn't, we never rigged it. We, we just pulled up to a canyon and started walking up it, you know, and that's a lot of the way I learned how to hunt this country from him was going in them canyons and finding we would walk them canyons without a dog just to know where we we're going to hunt the next morning you know oh, wow. and once we found once we found the bears were in there then we know that's where we went the next morning so yeah that's a di big difference i think that was when i know it made a big difference for me is instead of just going out and looking for game find what holds a game you know and nowadays things have gotten so much different with the gps and you wish well, you had that back then, Alvin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For the time it came out, I couldn't see it. <laughs> <laughs> now they make big screens. Another, another thing too. <laughs> so you guys would just take off on foot then, huh? Well, what we did, I seemed to be pretty lucky at it. I always had dogs that I could send. And if I sent them up a canyon 
and there wasn't no bear in it, you better find a way to get to the top of it and start looking on for them down the other side. Because when you sent them up a canyon, they meant to find a bear. Yeah. And that cut down on the plot, especially after, like Eddie said, we, we'd done our homework and knew there was bears there. But, uh, we, the dogs would cast for miles if they had to, two or three miles. Mm-hmm. And another thing, driving across country, seemed like I always, in later years, I always had a dog that was a real good rig dog out of the dog box. Mm-hmm. And you'd be just driving across country heading for another area. And if the bear crossed, well, you'd, you'd start that bear right out of the dog box. So you, you found bears both ways. And these, we're talking, I mean, mountain bears. Oh, yeah. Which is a different, different monster. I mean, when you say a four or 500 pound bear, I know there's guys out there that think that that's like a good bear, but it's not seven. You know, like they get back east, they get those monsters, big, fat. Oh, yeah. But like in Pennsylvania. Big frame. Pennsylvania back there. Yeah. They got monsters. Yeah. But. They don't got, they don't, we don't have bean fields for them to lay in and eat all day long and, you know, that sort of thing. Right. Well, and they're different bear. Those mountain bears, they get a way different frame on them. Cause I mean, where I'm at, we hunted a lot of the Northern California for bear up until 2012. I got lucky and got in with some guys and, you know, you compare those bears to bears that you see other places and the frames are just different. And they're a different mentality. You know, those were some, you could get on some rough ones. Did you guys ever get on any real rank ones? Oh, yeah. You have a lot of, a lot of them old boars that'll bay up. Some will eventually tree, some never tree. Just bay them all day? Yeah. Well, that's where your bear dogs come in. <laughs> we were, that's kind of a, a, a this can go back to a training thing. That's kind of why I, we never got into the tone in dogs or anything. When you're doing it for money, we wanted them suckers to stay as long as they could possibly stay. Long as it took. Long as it took. And I'll tell you a story. If you want to get into a story, he had a, Alvin had a little female. This is kind of staying power that we tried to breed to and want. Uh, had a little female called Sadie. And he got up to where we were going to hunt on a Friday night ahead of me. And he turned his dog loose on one, and it was in some bad, bad country. Anyways, that night he got treed off into a bad spot. The next morning we got up and was going to go back around there and struck a bear and, and turned loose on it and treed it. Well, by the time we got out from that one, it's 1 o'clock. And the... He we went on we went on around there and checked on that female and her clicker was still going off. And I got to her, I got to her about four o'clock that afternoon, and she'd been treed from five o'clock the night before. Oh wow! And, and she was still just clicking them off. She had you know she may have been treed the next morning. They no telling, but that's kind of the staying power that you want. You talk about dogs that are that you know bay and stay hooked up when you got clients they gotta you can't let them bay for an hour or two and expect to get them killed you know a lot of those bears don't get killed until four or five o'clock that night yeah just getting them in the right spot you've got to get a client to them there's all kinds of obstacles that you're dealing with that what kind of dog was she (laughs) Uh, i'll let alvin tell the story about that but this line of dogs she was a pac-man wasn't she this line of dogs Alvin found was the only straight registered dogs that I thought were as consistent as could be and come out here game catching track driving fast everything tell them about it Uh, well I got into the Pac-Man dogs just by accident a friend of mine that lived just a mile or so from me he was always dealing in dogs and stuff. And he ordered a dog out of some kennel in Oklahoma. Had no idea it, about the dog, just what the what the kennel owner told him. And, and he ordered this dog. And he got him out here. And he was, he was the only dog I ever seen in my life that could run a coal track. 
I'd always heard of dogs running cold tracks, but never seen it till that dog. But he could. He could actually just line out and run a cold track. And uh, the dog got a foxtail. Don didn't want to fool with him. So I, I took the dog and I tried to get him well. And I think he was over it and, and stuff and back to that. And it break out on him again. And he, but he never had no experience. And he was, he was a super bear dog. Just, you might say from day one. And he was straight out of that Pac-Man dog. He was the daddy to him. And gotcha. by that, I got in, I got acquainted with another guy back there in Pennsylvania by the name of Ed Hutzel. And he was breeding uh, Finley River dogs to Pac-Man. And I bought a, I bought a pup from him. And that pup turned in just overnight. He was a bear dog. When you turned them loose, they were bear dogs. And that's the only strain of dog, walker dogs that I ever seen in all of my years of hunting that was, you know, quality dogs in this country. And from there, we just kept dealing in those Pac-Man dogs until Pac-Man died. And they started breeding his sons. Well, the sons just did not produce. Well, that, that ended that era right there. Uh, but them, them Pac-Man dogs were, were special dogs. They really was. Just being able to move a track better, older tracks. Oh, oh unbelievable. That first dog I was just telling you about, he could run a cold track. I never seen none of the others do so much as, like that as he did. But they was all good, fast track dogs and tough dogs. They wasn't like them old long-eared walkers they sell for them night hunts they they was they was they was running dogs i mean they they had a lot of speed a lot of endurance yeah i've heard that about the pac-man stuff there was actually a bit of it around it seemed like but i don't know i don't follow the competition side a lot and i know a lot of guys kept that going well nobody nobody back there really they really didn't like him that much. They thought he was a renegade and yeah. all that. But what he did for the dogs out here, it, it was our kind of hound. You know, those, uh, they weren't false freeing. They weren't, they wanted to, to run down the game they were after. They were tough footed. You could hunt them day in and day out. And they were excellent strike dogs off the rig, on the ground, anywhere. Kind of. When them the them dogs started running out for Alvin and us is kind of when I well we had a litter before that it was out of a dog that Alvin had gotten and bred to a dog that Ed Feely had a red tick female that turned into a bunch of red and white dogs and the next ones after that were Nugget was all the trick dogs and the running dogs started coming in from there yeah, Nugget was a foundation. For a, a good strain of dogs here for, well, they, there might be still a little of it going now. I don't know. Yeah, there's still some. Every litter, every litter that she had was, there was good dogs. The one time, Eddie bred her to a, to a little fox dog from over on the coast, and that litter didn't turn out too well. One of them, one that I named Stone, he made a pretty good dog. But after that, they stayed with that. Gun dog, and he was, he goes back to that strain of dogs we was talking about in Merced. He, he was out of that line of dogs and everything out of gun and, and nugget was just super. My last dog, when I quit hunting, uh, I bought him from Eddie when he was about a year old, I guess. He was a little black dog, called him uh, Bullet. And oh man, a man had two or three like him today. It'd be dangerous. Yeah, he, he, was he, he was he was one of them that would catch you one when you didn't think there's a bear around. You crossing country, he'd strike if the bear ever crossed the road, he'd strike it. And he was a, a not just a bear dog. He was a cat dog, fox dog, everything. He was he was a special dog, and he's got some pups going now that. Are doing well. I is what I'm, from what I hear, I haven't seen any of them. Yeah, he was off a gun, gun and nugget. 
Yep. I don't know. That cross comes up a lot in conversations, it seems like. If you were to measure the amount of young dogs that were produced in the country over any other cross, by far, there was more out of that cross in yep. the country that, that made dogs at the end of the day. It wasn't like you're, you know, if you had six pups, you could just ding there about have six dogs are going to catch game. You know, there might be some that are better than others. Uh, you know, Bullet was an exception. He, Alvin actually bought two off me at the same time. One was Bullet and one was Sis. And Sis didn't make quite the dog, not near the dog that Bullet made. Still a game catching dog. But as far as the litter goes, uh, that cross, they were, and, and we crossed him or we crossed her to another dog. And that was Skeeter. And that, and you own him too. Yeah. And he was a good dog. Yeah. Hog killed him. Yeah. Hog killed him. But oh dang! They were they were that was an unreal cross. They just all clicked, and on all different game too, right? I mean, it guys were running them on everything. Oh uh, no, it didn't matter. That's one thing I can say, Jason, and I've I said it before to you. But me and Alvin Lewis w- w- Cougar too. Uh, every dog that we had had to catch everything we didn't keep one for this and one for that and one for this it they 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 go when we go to the woods we aim to catch something and it don't matter what it is they had to be that you know we didn't have 20 dogs and there was a pack of cat dogs and a pack of bear dogs and a pack of fox dogs you know so that's one thing i like about them line of dogs and the the pack men were the same way they they catch anything if you put them after it they were going to catch it yeah to maintain that type of dogs, that's why it's so hard, even with some good strains of dogs going today, to it, to keep dogs that will satisfy you, that'll that'll make the type of dog you want. There's there's just so many of them that even with the strains of going, it's good like Bullet and and all of those dogs. Uh, there, there's some that didn't make it or didn't make near the near that good. Bullet out a litter mate named Solo that was uh, a a good dog too. He was red. Bullet was black. But uh, it's so hard to get the type of dog you want if you're not careful. Now you go back to what I said earlier. You don't go for the breed. You go for the type of dog that you want to hunt. Yeah, that's a big hang up too. I was in that too, man. I had blue ticks forever that's all i was gonna hunt it was gonna be a blue dog and now there's not one on the place you know they all got old and died <laughs> off and <laughs> they caught game but man it's it was different when i figured out what i wanted to do it, you just had to look like you're saying for the dog individual dog instead of just looking at a breed you you were, said that you reminded me of a little story i'll tell you we was hunting above home there in that Mariposa County, and, and uh, this guy by the name of Joe Sanford, he was he went hunting with us a few times, and he had mixed up dogs. He had blue ticks and other dogs, and and uh, we had or I did. I had bullet and sis and and uh, those dogs, and and we got after a bear, and that's real tough brush country, and we. The bear took that out down a long big canyon and uh, got away from us for a while. And uh, we finally caught up with him. We didn't have that GPS then. We were still using tracking collars. And we finally caught up with him. And we stopped and, and bullet and them dogs, they was treed off in the canyon across the road. And here come that old blue dog. <laughs> mile behind he finally got up on the road and he stopped him and he was complaining I said Joe what do you want to bring a plow horse up here for and run with thoroughbreds <laughs> <laughs> yeah you gotta have thick skin if you're running blue dogs I learned that real quick <laughs> but I have seen some blue dogs that could run not very many but I have seen a few 
<laughs> That's what I always joke with everyone because they give me a bad time. But yeah, everybody's got a story about one good one. <laughs> Just one, usually. <laughs> well, Alvin, you've been hunting for 80 years. There's got to be one in there. <laughs> Your odds aren't that good. <laughs> I think of that. Every year it seems to roll around. There's one of those, buddy calls them a Mimi. I think they're a mam. I don't even know. I'm not hip on all that. But it's a truckload of fox dogs. And there's one blue tick in there. Yeah. It's, it's something about that must be one good blue dog or something like that. I usually get tagged in it every year. You got a bunch of sorry fox dogs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's another way to look at it. So what about, I mean, I want to hear some stories too, if you've got them. Are there any good ones, Eddie, you want to bring up? Because you well, spent some time around them early on. I want Alvin and I've, told him today when he tells the story, I don't, I want him to give you the details because a lot of young hunters ain't never seen this, especially with this type of tracking equipment you have these days and, and a lot of the way the country is, but the country we're hunting in this, a few of these stories, uh, they're going to blow your mind. Alvin, tell them about the story that we had. We, we was up here on the, up the canyon from Eddie's house here this has been a few years ago, uh, up on uh, Solo Ridge. It's a, it's a big high mountain, and there's a river canyon on on both sides of it, really. Yeah, and they're deep. Well, the reservation was on one side of it, and uh, we got Eddie and I got after a bear, and it, of course they went over the ridge and. Out of here, and so we had to go around through the reservation out of out of road, and we finally found them tree, and we walked off in there to them, and it was hot, very hot. We walked off down in there to them, and we got the dogs, and Eddie said, "You know what? We can go right on down this canyon and hop over that first ridge, and we'll we'll hop out on on Cow Mountain." Hold on, now I gotta stop him for just a second. I just want you to know it took us two hours to get to the tree when he said this, uh, the first to the tree to the first time. So in my mind, we had a three hour walk back uphill. Now go ahead, Alvin. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can just hop over this ridge and, and come out on Cow Mountain and we'll get somebody to come pick us up. And so, well, I'm telling you right now, I'm going to do it under protest. <laughs> and we got them dogs and we went down that canyon and walked and walked and walked. Finally, we decided once we was going to pull out to the left and try to catch a road and go back up to our truck. And we got up there a little ways and, and uh, it was so hot we couldn't stand it. So we had to go back to the creek so we'd have water. And we wound up walking clear into the bottom of that Indian reservation about 12 hours downhill and we got hooked up with a drunk Indian <laughs> and him and his two daughters, and they was all drunk. And we paid them to take us back to our trucks. <laughs> and that was, it's still under protest. <laughs> Best money you ever spent, probably. <laughs> oh, my goodness. We, what a, what a me and Alvin had $111. I re I'll remember it to the penny. We dug up $111 to pay this old boy to take us back up to the top. And it was, it was probably three hours of truck drive up this oh. old road. Wasn't it, Alvin? Yeah, and he wanted, then he wanted more money. Yeah, when he got to the top. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, he had time to think about it. He had three hours <laughs> Yeah, that was that was one that was. I know he said that story in a real short amount of time, but it wasn't short. No, <laughs> it no. was an all day deal. It was dark when we got back to our truck. Yeah. yeah, yeah. People nowadays don't realize that used to actually be more common than not. You know, it wasn't a quick hunt. That's for sure. It was over the course of all day. <laughs> well, you know, before even before the the tracking collars. Man, you dogs get away from you. You just had to use your what little you knew about the country and the instinct to where to go. And you'd drive and look and look and look for dogs. Sometimes you'd never find them. And you knew they was treed somewhere, but 
didn't make any difference because you couldn't find them. Yeah. There's a I'll tell you another story that me and Alvin was both on. Is is winter time by now? I think it's in December. Remember the Kern River? We had to swim the Kern River. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Kern River down here is well. It, I don't know if you've heard that song from uh, Merle Hager. I'll never swim Kern River again. Mm -hmm. That's that's the same river. There's lots and lots of people's died in this river swimming. It's a it's a pretty rank river. Anyhow, the day before. We're driving along this road. It's called, we call it 23 mile road. And there's about four or five inches of snow on the ground. And we go around this corner, dogs blow up and we look up this rock ledge. That's probably a hundred foot. And this old bear had slid off this, which would, should have told us that we, we, better, we better not run this one, slid off this and into the road and down the road and off into the canyon, and it's just a big old roughy, bluffy son of a gun. And uh, we turn the dogs loose on it, and they run off in the canyon, run all over in there, and they finally hit to the river. And the, we didn't know for sure if they had caught the bear down there because all you could hear is a roar. But what had happened is that bear had got to that river, a spot in it, and he slum it. And Alvin had a female, and I had a dog. Uh, a male dog, and they swam it after him. They never did catch the bear that day that, that we know the best no. of. So we let them, it's, they, they go up, they cross out across the canyon and go way up into some other country. Well, the next morning we get over there and they're back to the river, but they ain't swimming. <laughs> <laughs> and by this time, it snowed that night. There's probably eight, ten inches of snow on the, on, right at the river on both sides. And they're, this country, there ain't no way of crossing this thing. And me and Alvin go off in there to him, and we're standing there, and his little female, I can see her across the river. The other, my my dog's kind of laid up somewhere just down the creek a little ways or down the river a little ways. We uh, we make this huge plan that that uh, we're going to swim this. We, if we're going to get the dogs, we got to swim the river. And this river is a roll. You know, we know that it's, you know, it's got to be 30 degrees or better, or oh, yeah. cooler than that. Maybe in the 20s, I don't know. Probably it's cold. 20s. It's a cold sucker. So we jump in there, swim that sucker, get them dogs, swim it back. And I'm talking, that thing's probably 40 feet wide or, yeah, or, more. or more. And it's wide and wow. deep. I mean, it's you're, there's parts that you're paddling. And we leash them up and, and swim back across this thing and... Get on the shore and you know everything in your body is just tingling, like tingling ice. We dump our boots out <laughs> and we hit that mountain as hard as we could go to get out of there to make it back to the I don't know that I ever stopped. I was so cold. <laughs> but uh that was one of those near death, like if we wouldn't have done it, the dogs would have died. Yeah. And there, and there is no way down the river to get out of it. I mean, they, you were going to have to swim in or, or leave them there, you know. And to get to them, there's no trail off where they were. It's just solid bluffs for, you know. I don't know how we got down there, really. Yeah. But you you know, you're you're helping one another off every little bluff you go down or, or helping one another up, you know, leashes and whatever happened. But that was a bad, 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 bad hunt. Those are the ones that make you think. I mean, you get in those situations, and if you've been doing this long enough, you've been there, and it makes you question your sanity. Yeah. I want Alvin to tell a story about him and Randy. They went to a, a canyon. Tell them about Ant Creek. Oh, actually, we was on the, the rim of the Kern River, and we was guiding, and we, we, you know, we didn't care where we went when we was guiding. We we went to get after a bear. You can't catch one till you start them. So we pulled up there on this side road, and uh, we struck a bear. And they went over this little ridge and out, out of our hearing. We went back to the truck and w went around a little ways and walked up on this ridge, and we could hear them treed off in there. And we started getting things ready to go and had a client. 
his name was Avi. Wasn't that it? Avi. Yep. Yeah. He 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 was a crack shot with a forty four pistol. He was really a good shot. Anyway, we'd had him hunting before, and we walked up, up and we started off there to him. And downhill, it took us a half a day to get to him. Jeez. You've never seen so much brush in all your life. And we finally got to him, shot the bear, skinned it all out, and packed, put it in the packs and started out of there. And we got into places where you had to crawl with those packs on your back. I mean, it was, it was terrible. And we finally got out of there. And got down to the kern. We had to swim the kern to get to the road. The road <laughs> was on the other side of the river. We, oh no! We got we got, got out of there, and that guy that we had a hunt, and he says, "I'm going to turn you guys in." I said, what do, you, "What do you mean?" He said, "I got a complaint. What is it?" He said, "He said you guys been mean to me." <laughs> <laughs> I said, I don't know what you mean. We went through the same thing you did. And he did. He he turned us in for treating him rough. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, 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 yeah. he did. He turned you <laughs> out he took us, or something. Yeah, that? That's why you had to have that uh, bond. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it took us about, oh, probably 10, 12 hours to go through there. They, they ain't none of that in this country easy if you get around that current river. Yeah. Well, and you say it's brushy. It, the brush down there is different than a lot of places. It's hard brush. Yeah, you guys got them ferns and and uh, stuff up there. More. Yeah. The difference down here, Jason, a lot of this country is the brush is all laid up into the bluffs. Yeah. So it's, <clears throat> it's big boulders brushy rocky it all kind of melts together so it's not like running on an open hill on a on a just a round brush brushy mountain there's bluffs in the middle of all of it and everything else so you uh a lot of a lot i've hunted i'll say it i've hunted all over now the western united states and i think right here is as rough as it gets yeah well you'd referenced cow mountain earlier i mean is that the cow mountain people still talk about today no no that's up at clear lake isn't it yeah that's up there yeah, yeah there not we're we're uh it's a cow mountain on a ranch that's right here above my house all that country that we're talking about if you'd leave my house right behind my place it pulls straight up and it goes right into the forest right into it and on the ranch is Cow Mountain. So when we were coming down that big canyon that he's talking about in the res, you can see, you know, 40 miles out there ahead of you, Cow Mountain. <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> so if people wanted to kind of see the country, I mean, now with Google Earth, you can just pull all that up. Like what, what's the closest town or, or like landmark if someone wanted to see it and you're okay putting yeah. that information out there, Eddie? Well, it's, you're looking at, uh, Tom Springville, all above Springville, all above, you know, or Ponderosa. But when you're sitting at Ponderosa, it sheds to the Kern River side and it sheds to the Thule side. And we hunted both of them and all the way out to, to the Paiutes, uh, you name it. Uh, it. It's all rough down here from the park to, I'd say, Finger Tatsby. I want to make a point again, though, for this country. You don't want to get hung up on a breed of dogs. You got all those registered dogs. You don't want to get hung up on a breed. You got to stay with the right type of dog. You just have to. If you don't have the right type, it's like that plow horse and the thoroughbred. They just, they don't catch nothing. Kind of. Kind of, this kind of can tie in, Jason, to you know some of the training stuff that Cougar's talking to you about, the podcast that we had last time. It takes a really special type of dog to catch game here. You can go anywhere with this type of dog that we're hunted here, 
and go anywhere else and catch game. It was fairly, I'm, I'm not saying that we didn't have to get used to the country, but for the most part, these dogs did it everywhere if they could do it here. Oh, yeah. You know. Yeah, absolutely. So. Well, and having that hard dog, you know, a dog that can handle the terrain, because I know it's rough. Were you guys starting to pups like super young or were you letting them mature a little so that they could keep up in the country? Or when would you start a dog, Alvin? I never did like to start one till they could stay up because they, they all would just learn bad habits of chasing the dogs. Yeah. No, I, I like for them to be able to stay up. Is there, was there like an age that you start him, like a year? Yeah, some, you know, 10 months. Year old, some just kind of depended on the pup. Yeah. And a little bit, Jason, depending on what time of the year that pup hit. You know, if you have a a ten month old pup that was in the middle of winter time and you're running a different game, it's a little bit different. But if you're this time of year trying to turn them loose in this big country behind one of them woolly burgers and have all them dogs in front of them that you know, that's got so much experience, you know, in five minutes, them young dogs ain't going to know where the old dogs went. And yeah. Then they ain't going to learn nothing but how to run behind or follow, you know. Uh, just because that country's so rough, I mean, obviously you were hunting before there was tracking, really. I mean, especially GPS. Were they big ball mouth dogs? Like something that carried? No, I, I always liked the high-pitched, sharp, chop mouth dog. I never did go for the ball mouth. I've I've had some. My very first rig dog that I had, and it was a walker dog. He was he was straight ball mouth, but I never you can hear those high pitched chop mouth dogs a lot further than you can those ball mouth. No, I think so too. They just carry better. Yeah. Yeah, and then that every time they gotta let out one of them barks, they gotta back up two or three steps before they get going with that big old ball mouth. <laughs> yeah, it always made me think. It's like, man, how can those dogs run when they're just screaming, bawling every breath? You know, it's like, how do you have enough air left to run? You know what they do? They bark 90 and run 10. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's, God, been, there's, there's been everything that's been good dogs over the years. We're not trying to down one that's the other but for the most part this is kind of what's worked for us and it's always been a typeier running type dog that is good footed and not afraid you know alvin had a dog that made a good cross his name was earl and he was just a walker dog i don't even know what the heck he was dude. Yeah. He, there ain't no telling what he was no. but when he the first ones he ever put him on jason he didn't even know what they were. And after two or three, he'd come across the road laying on his belly. And he's a big dog, plenty big enough. And his old tail would be, or his old tongue would be hanging out on his side. And he'd be throwing gravel. You'd have to look out because if he's in his way, he's going to get took out. And that's the kind of dog you had to have here because these old critters in this big country not that they're running any faster than anything anywhere else. They can just gain so much more ground. So yeah. if they don't, if your dog ain't running hard, they won't ever catch up. They can't put enough pressure on one. Yeah, that makes sense, especially that mountain country. It seemed like, you know, the ones that could, if they were gaining a little on you, getting up out of it, by the time they crest the top, you know, they're gaining ground every second until those dogs can stay up. So if there wasn't enough pressure, it just, it drug things out, it seemed like. Oh, yeah. Yeah, or, or, or never catch them. Or right. They put them to cold trailing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's not a good thing when the race goes from hot back to cold trailing. <laughs> you <laughs> got to get back yeah. under them. Yeah, sure. They yeah, sure do it. And, and I've seen them do it to some good dogs, too. These, they've got some of these canyons it, it some of it's hard to describe some of it uh, and i tell you you've got it right there that stair creek is a tougher river canyon as some of it it goes into the river anyways yeah and them old bears get to angling in there and they just angle in and out of every one of those side canyons and and they're running on the side hill all the time and them dogs got to run on that too you know 
they're raised there, and these hounds are after them, so they've got to learn how to run through that rough stuff. And then when they come to a bluff, how much time do they got to take? Or are they going to go right off of it where the bear did? You know, uh, right. Some of these dogs that uh, that they they didn't they didn't give a, a bear a chance to get too far ahead on them. They just bell right behind them. They might be yeah. throwing a little caution to the wind, but they did it. Well, like you said, though, that was a different kind of dog. Yep, they have to be. How, um, like with the guide, and I mean, obviously the country's rough and you got turned in once, <laughs> but I mean, how were most of the clients when they came into it? I mean, were they prepared or were they expecting that? Well, there was one outfitter that we worked for that was pretty, pretty, uh, untruthful. <laughs> <laughs> he had tell. He would, I'm not going to mention no names, but he would tell those clients when he was trying to book them anything that they wanted to hear just to get their deposit. And this ain't me that did this, Jason. Just you know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll clear Eddie's name now. <laughs> and sometimes you get out there and uh, me and Lewis tree one over here off of the highway above Ponderosa. And uh, we took him down through this guy. Uh, what was that old man's name? Was it John Holford? Wolford. Holford. Yeah. Holford. Holford. Yeah. 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 And we started taking the other woman with him. They was older. I mean, they was probably in their sixties anyway. And, uh, and you know, they weren't shape. Oh no. And, uh, we started side healing down to them dogs. There's treat wasn't treat very far. Man, he went to complain. He said, man, nobody told us we was going to have to do anything like this. <laughs> and, <laughs> I said, well, I don't know what you expect, but well, you got to go to where the dogs are treated if you're going to get a bear. And they don't bring them to you. <laughs> and uh, that woman's actually out walking him, but we finally got him through there and uh, got the bear. But they, you run into all sorts of them guiding, believe me. That same guy, Jason, I, they, these are things that happened 20 years ago, and I'll never, I'll for, never forget them. We was walking off a little old. This was after the Alvin took him, but I took him on another hunt a few years later. <coughs> and he was one. Oh, Andy came back. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, he came back several times. He's a goofy old man. But anyway, we was walking off this little old hill, and we hadn't went a quarter mile. And I look back, and he's laying on his back. And I'm thinking, oh, shit. I've just, this guy's having a heart attack on me in the woods. <laughs> I'm I'm worried now. I take off running back up there, and he's laying on his back. And I go, "You all right? You all right?" And he goes, "Yeah." He goes, "My knees are feeble, and I'm starting to perspire." <laughs> <laughs> oh, he is a dandy. <laughs> yeah. Another time, we had some Orientals over here in uh, in uh, White River country, did, did different, little better, easier areas than this, and we treat a bear. For them, and we come down a trail to them and, and kill the bear and everything. And it's easy walk. And uh, we got started out, got back to the trail, and got started out of there going on downhill. And this leader of those, they, they always got somebody that's in charge when you deal with those Orientals. And uh, he come up there, they had, they fell behind, we was waiting on him. He come up there where we was at, and he's 30 minutes. I said, What? He said, my partner cannot go no more. We take a 30 minute nap and then we be there. <laughs> <laughs> so we just had to sit there on the side of the trail and wait till they come. 30 minutes they come. <laughs> oh, man. Do you get into when you guide these hunters? I mean, every outfitter will say the same thing, especially when you got dogs. If you don't have dogs, it's easier and different because you're not on a time schedule, you know, but when you're when you're behind a pack of hounds, everything's on a time schedule, it seems like. Yeah. You get into all kinds of deals out. One time we treed one. I mean, it was it was a ways off, but it was up a trail, a pretty decent trail. And Alvin, for some reason, we sent Alvin, it doesn't happen this very often, but me and Lewis sent Alvin to the tree, and we had the client, and it was an Oriental guy. About a quarter <laughs> mile into it, he quit on us. And me and Lewis put him on each of our shoulders and drug him, clumb to the tree. And you could look back 
for as long as you could see, there was two lines drug in between <laughs> us two where he just turned his feet backwards and just let them drag. <laughs> we drug him. Oh he gosh. just looked, flopped on his back. Remember that was over the 23 mile road at the very end. Yeah. Wild that's field. Crazy. Another time, I hit this back country here off of the other side of Ponder Rose off of Western Divide Highway where we treated one. We had a little Oriental guy with us. Just He was by himself. They treed off at the canyon below the road there, and we got everything, went down there, and got the dogs tied up. And he shot the bear, made a good shot, killed it dead. And he started grunting around, trying to say something, but, and, but we couldn't understand him. He go, mm, 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 mm. And we finally figured out what he wanted. He wanted us to cut that chest cavity open. <laughs> and he, he had a little styrofoam cup with him, and he reached in that chest cavity and cup, di di dipped out a cup of blood and drank it right there on the spot. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, you see all kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were, they loved to do that. And they loved to cut that liver up and dip it in crown. That was like their ceremonial deal. Yeah. Dip it, in that they, dip it in crown, like crown Royal. Yeah, yeah. They would take crown Royal to the tree with them in their little bitty pack. You wouldn't know it. <laughs> but as soon as you started getting into the cavity, you know, they, they would cut that chunks of that liver up and they would dip it into that crown and then eat it. Just like, just straight. So it's warm, you know? Uh, Interesting. Yeah. They were, they were, uh, great people though, for the most part, they were, you know, you'd always have some doozies on anybody, but then people, they, they respected what they were doing. They may have parts of the bear may have been meant to them than more than us, but, uh, to me, they used every drop of it. Yeah. So. Yeah. And and you know and, and those uh, Koreans, they're mostly the ones that come. They think the bear is big medicine. They yep. they they really respect that bear. Yeah. I used to I think, think that it was just gallbladders, but it's not. It's everything. They. Oh yeah, they use the whole thing. Everything. I mean, and I think bears on a whole, like there's something. There's something about them. I mean, that's why we get hooked. I mean, I still spot and stalk them. We can't run dogs here, but right. There's something different about a bear, and they have. I mean, it seems like every group of people, it, they have this like higher. I don't know. Draw to the bears, like they mean something. They're a symbol, or they're using them for medicinal purposes. And it's so funny because, you know, like in your state fishing game i mean it's it's just a bear right right like until you're the one using it yeah it's uh i kind of feel the same way it's way different to kill a bear than it is a deer sure well I mean, it's a deeper any, meaning anytime you're dealing with predators over prey it's a different game right yeah you know and that's i've always been drawn to predators even though i've loved to kill a big buck but predator hunting or Training one predator to put enough effort into catching another predator. Those are th those are not easy traits, right? No, I mean, I know I've talked with guys that have said, you know, I can take a 12-week-old pup and put it on bear scent, and I can tell you if it's going to make a bear dog or not right then and there because <laughs> you know, there's something that just turns them off. You know, even as a young pup, they know that that is something to be a cautious of. I guess, or they know that they're predator. One time we had another group of Orientals. Most, most all of our guide hunting was up this canyon behind Eddie's house in this general area. Anyway, we, it was me and Lewis and we, uh, come off the top up there, Eddie on that, on that side road we used to camp on there off the Redwood Drive. Yeah. Yeah. And they've treed out that ridge. Right. Um, almost over to the, to the big mountain and, uh, Jordan. We, yeah. Yeah. And we uh, got there and, and there was three or four men and a, and a woman, little old bitty woman. And we got there and tied the dogs up and, and we had a kind of a mess there. They almost shot Lewis. Shot right I at remember him. that. Shot yeah. Lewis right at, right at his feet. It did hit him and we got onto him and stuff and we, ended, we finished up and put the bear in the pack and started out of there and we hit going downhill to come out on the highway. And I'm kind of neck about last and I'm walking along there. 
and uh, I see this wallet laying in the trail. And I just picked it up and stuck it in the pocket. Then we walked on out and we got to the road. I asked this just one group. They they had a leader. He was he was in charge of everything. I asked him. I said, "Did you uh, lose anything?" He said, "No, I don't think so." I said, "You better check." And he went to feeling around his pockets and stuff, and he he said, "Oh my God!" And I had his wallet in my back pocket, and I give it to him, and that thing had thousands of dollars in it. I'll oh, be. Yeah. Or he, he, he was thankful. Do you think he wasn't happy? Yeah. <laughs> one of the other group, I ain't going to say who, <laughs> one of the other group said, good thing I didn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> but I gave it back to him. I never, never looked at it. <laughs> but I see all that. I mean, it wouldn't hardly fold him. It's hard to hide that kind of money. Yeah, <laughs> we, me, and Alvin had a a guy, a guy that Alvin's talking about a little bit. His name Randy Ballinger. It's, he used to be an old uh, hunting buddy, of Alvin's. Anyhow, we had this group of guys all together. The Al Gas group, and <laughs> they come several years. You talk about a mess. Now these guys were a mess. Me and Lewis and Randy and Alvin were all hunting different ways. We got five of them. And uh, somehow me and Le- Alvin catch a bear. I think Randy did too. Was in the, but anyways, we catch a bear in the, in a cave. And we get to the cave, and I crawl up, and this hole's if you can imagine, this hole's about five foot around for about fifteen feet back, and then it gets into like you gotta shove your shoulders into it and look directly left, and about twenty feet up that little shaft is where the bear's at. So I crawl in there and get the dogs all pulled back. And Randy's a big old boy. Randy's probably six, six or what? Weighs 250. So he couldn't crawl in there. Our client was a little bitty guy. So I get in there and I find where the bear's at and everything else and kind of tell the client what we got to do. And I think we spend 45 minutes trying to talk him in to getting into that hole to shoot this bear. <clears throat> it was a, it was a chore. We finally, I mean, and he's been crying and then pumped up and then I'm going to do it and then back to crying and everything else. He's a mess. <laughs> so we we finally get him talked into it. Now, if you picture this, you when they come out of that bigger area where you can, the five foot area, it kind of goes out about five feet and then it falls off about a 20 foot lead. Maybe not 20 foot, maybe more like 14 or so, but anyhow. We talk, call him in there, and finally he reaches around that corner. And by this time, he ain't got no shirt on. He's down to his, he thinks it's best to have no shirt on. So he shoots one time with a 44, and I don't even know if he hit it. But he comes squalling out of there, and he went by me and Randy, which was standing in the five-foot area, and like a bullet. And he hit that 14-foot drop, and he went below Alvin. <laughs> oh, no. Running. He never even knew. And the bear finally, did, he got to squirming around there, and we heard him coming. And he kind of went between me and Randy's legs underneath him, and Randy was emptying his 44 out when he come underneath us. But Randy finally killed it. Randy finally killed it right underneath our feet. <laughs> but that old boy, he... I think I don't know that Alvin got him stopped before he got to the truck off in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Alvin's screaming at him to slow down and stop, and he's not looking back. He don't even know if the bear's coming or not. He's still going to take no chance. Hey, he was he was <laughs> anticipating. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> What's that they say? Everybody wants to be a cowboy until it's time to do cowboy shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he was using that old saying, I don't got to be fast. I just got to be faster. No three. <laughs> yeah, that's the truth, too. <laughs> uh, anyway. Yeah, I mean, I'm telling you, the stories you hear from you guys that have been guiding, they crack me up. Because we all, like, like as houndsmen, you know, we've got, everybody's got a story. You know, near-death experience or something, but... You're dragging some of these people out that have never, I mean, I'm assuming even been hunting before. Oh, and then you're putting them in a situation that can get a little hairy. It's You never know what's going to happen. I kind of look at it just a lot like this, Jason. 
You know, you hear a lot of people talk to you about or give you likes on Facebook by the way your dogs are trained under a tree or whatever. And they don't know nothing of what it took to get that whatever they're after in the tree. Yeah. And they judge it from, boy, that dog sounds good under a tree or whatever. That's a lot what these clients look at from a picture in a brochure or whatever. You know, you can mm -hmm. always make it sound like, hey, it ain't that bad. You can all do it, you know. Uh, <laughs> if everyone could do it, they'd be doing it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's how you that's how they're buying the hunt is a lot like a guy might look at a dog without being able to judge what what kind of dog it took to get it there, you know. Yeah. From birth to that first tree is a job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the job. Ain't no guarantees. <laughs> no. You know, I'm pretty lucky. Every year we do a, a couple of veterans hunts with the Houndsman for Heroes. And you know, these are guys that are retired military, you know, medical discharge. They come from all walks. Um, but it's funny because we get a group of guys together and we hit the woods. I mean, it, I'm assuming a lot like if you're guiding a client, you know, the mission is to get these guys a bobcat and go show them a good time and let them see what it's all about. And they all come in, you know, they do their research and they got a little bit of a concept of what happens, but they have zero clue. They know the beginning and the end. And then the whole middle section, it's like crash course in hound dog education. Yeah. Because we have had them tell us on multiple occasions, this is the hardest thing I have had to do since basic training. You guys are absolutely insane. It's been 36 hours and we haven't slept. Or, you know, the country you got to go through and you're explaining it to them and they're looking at it like, no, not going to do, like, how do we even get down there? Right. I would imagine, you know, like guiding people, it's, that's got to take a lot on their part too. It does. Yeah. And it's, you you learn to become a salesman because you're trying to sell everything. You know, everything's uh my my wife always uses this against me. It's always a hundred yards more, a hundred yards more, just around the corner, <laughs> just around the corner. <laughs> Eddie's saying he gets paid to lie to people. Yeah. That's what he's saying. Now, uh, to be quite honest with you, uh, Alvin was the a guy that always did all the encouraging. <laughs> he was back there with them, like, come on, you gotta keep going. Well, yeah. I'd always just try to, I'd embarrass them because I was so much older than most of them. Yeah. 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 That, that would keep them going. Oh, I can think of a couple times I probably deserved to get killed by my wife telling her, oh, it's just the next ridge. We just got to pop over the ridge and we're there. <laughs> right. How long did you guide for? About 20 years. 20, 25 years. Long time. And you were hunting clients several times a week, or were you hunting just weekends? Uh, no, sometimes, especially Andy, he had a lot of clients that come through the week. And some of them was just weekenders, just, you know, it depend on how they were booked. Did you have a camp set up that you, like, had a base camp they came to, or were they just in the truck with you from beginning to end? No, we had, we had camp trailers, we had our camp, and and they they would, mostly they would supply their own uh, lodging. Most of them like to get a motel. Were they interested in the dogs? I mean, afterwards, did you have a lot of guys that were, you know, asking questions or were they just kind of there to get their bear and go home? Mostly their bear. I had a couple of little Oriental guys and they was staying there at the Pier Point uh, motel. That's up the canyon from Eddie's house also. And I had two females. I had uh, one called Sugar and and the other one's name was Ruby. And the dog boxes we used, they got vents in them. And this one Oriental, he just insisted on petting my dog. And I told him, I said, you better stay away. They're going to bite you. And he just insisted he was going to pet them. He finally, they was trying to push through that hole as hard as they could, stretching their necks just as far as they could, trying every way in the world to, to grab him. And he... he he did stay out of reach of them, but he did. He probably believed me they were going to bite him. Yeah. What was the end of the guiding? I mean, what made you decide to quit? They stopped our bear hunting. Just the outlawing of it, huh? They did. They dogs are not allowed. That that was the thing that for California took the wind out of my sails. It was 
devastating to me. Yeah, when they took that away, I know that for us, I mean, we're just over the border. So yeah. our group of guys that, you know. Did you I, guys get your lion season back? Oh, no. No, no. We can kill three a year, but not with dogs. Huh. You just got to spot and stock them. Huh. And no bear. You know? No, no. Just spot and stock. That's why we were driving to California every weekend. Yeah. You know, we'd leave our trailers down there on the fruit growers land and we'd just run back and forth on weekends till the either quota was met or our trailers were going to get snowed in. Yeah. And we'd just run down there and, you know, all of a sudden 2012 rolls around and it was done. You know, I was only two years into hunting at that point. I had just really gotten into dogs. And it's like, then it just gets jerked out from under you. Yeah. And it was a sad deal. You know, we had several generations in that camp of my buddy's family. And then all of a sudden it just stops. I mean, and that was pretty much the end of the whole group. You know, some of us still stay in touch, but man, it just took the wind out of everybody's sails. And, you know, that's when I switched to running these Fox and whatnot. But yeah, well, California had lost it before too, didn't they? And then got it back. For one year. It was just one year they yeah. shut it down, right? Yeah. Something to do with the environmental impact report that they found. Oh, those, yeah. Those antis found a loophole and, and they found a judge that would that would uh, go along with them and they should stop it for one year. That's one of their favorite lines, too, environmental impact studies. Yeah. I mean, that's just tie things up for as long as we can. And that's their, that's, their that got, motive. That got to be the hardest thing for an outfitter. You know, everybody guided here, but I was one of the ones that created an outfit. And the only reason why I did is because you, I wanted to get a use permit. Well, mm -hmm. the use permits for the forest. Uh, and th at the end, the early years, it was easy. But at the end... They wanted you to pay for this environmental impact study. And the, if you had to pay for that damn thing, it would have been more that you could have made the whole year, you know, guiding bear hunting. So it wouldn't pencil. I think they just seen through that, the Forest Service did, or the smart people in it, and said, hey, if we don't have these guys managing these bears, they're gonna, it's going to be unreal, you know. <laughs> Yeah, look at the boat they're in now. Yeah, you're seeing it now. And, and especially as many fires as you have and you start to see all these condensed. The, the, there's kind of, there's places in this country right now where, you know, when Alvin first came to this country, there's a little town up here called Camp Nelson. And there was nothing for four or five bears to go through that town and tear doors off of it at night and eat whatever they had in there. If there was nobody in there or whatever, there were so many of them. Well, that's kind of what it's coming back to now. Yeah, that's the stuff they don't think about. No. Nope. I know there are such a slew of bears between, you know, California and Oregon, Washington too. But it's like, here we got a great management tool and a source of revenue for the states and they just can't, can't keep it going or don't want to. You know what California thought they was going to do? They thought they was going to stop it from all of us and they were going to hire two or three guys to take care of the whole state. <laughs> good luck with that that didn't go nowhere there's no way i mean especially country like that if anybody's been listening i mean you're dedicating some real time to take care of you know getting a bear killed right no and i know they're overflowing bad it's been i mean i really hope to see it come back it'd be nice to see it in california and oregon and washington Trouble of it is, once it's signed into law, it's almost impossible to get it changed. Yeah, it's weird, though, because it seems like we've been getting some wins here and there across the U.S. You know, Montana getting a bear season, that was a huge win for Houndsmen. It'd be nice if we could see these tides shift a little bit. Yep, they, they don't have uh, Gavin Newsom. <laughs> <laughs> that's the truth <laughs> you guys could ship him over there yeah he's got ground up there I, I, he's always in montana for some reason or another <laughs> he goes to run away yeah well where are you guys uh you guys headed out in the morning yeah we'll go uh go up here above the house here and i want to take alvin out let him hear the dogs a little bit lewis is coming tonight uh Coming in tonight. He should be on his way. On his way. So we'll go we'll go make a run in the morning. 
Well, you know what happens when you're the last one to camp. I mean, you can just put him to work now. Yeah, uh, it's it's pretty. Uh, he's gonna have a pretty gravy deal. All he's got to do is get here and crawl into a camper. There you go. Well, guys, it, we're going on an hour and a half. We should probably wrap it up. But I got one more question, and I'm sure Alvin's been doing this long enough. Have, has Eddie warned you about the train wrecks? And we like to hear the the bad ones too. <laughs> No, not really. <laughs> you got a good train wreck story to share with us when things just kind of went south? That one's about the best one I got going to the casino. <laughs> that, one was, uh, that was a bad one. I'm trying to think of one offhand. Well, I'll tell you what. If we don't have a good train wreck, <laughs> let me ask you this. What was it? I mean, obviously, you'd been hunting for a while and you got hooked up with Eddie. I mean, what was it that drew you to, to keep hunting with him? I'm going to put you on the spot. Well, I mean, finding good people to hunt. Okay, let me, let me start from scratch. I told, I, I've been blessed all my life. Because for some reason or other, younger hunters always kind of, I kind of was kind of like a magnet. It kind of drew them to me. At first, it was Randy Ballinger. He's about 20 years younger than me. Then it was Lewis. And then it was Eddie. It's just been, just been kind of a, a stair step situation. I've, and Eddie and I have had a lot of good hunts together. Uh, when, when he, when he started hunting with me, he was just a kid. And we went from there to, well, old oh man. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm 82 years old now and he's 47 or 48. So, you know, uh, I don't know what other guys thought about it, but I always felt blessed to be hunting with younger guys because if things, as years progressed, things got too bad, they'd always say, well, I'll just stay here. I'll go get them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's why he keeps Cougar around now, huh? <laughs> well, Cougar, Cougar and I have been friends for a long time. I didn't get to hunt very much with him, but I hunted quite a bit. Yeah. For well, and it's it goes both ways. I mean, it's nice when you have guys like you that are willing to take younger hunters in because I think that's what turns a lot of people off is they spend a lot of time beating their head against the wall when there's guys out there that can mentor and, and help them out. You know, it's nice when you can get hooked up. I I had that when I started, you know, and I was willing to jump in the canyons and go get dogs just to be around those guys and learn. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's a big advantage. Oh, it's good to have quality people to be your mentors through it. And I got to tell you, for the record, there's been times, you know, me and Alvin over the years has been like oil and water at times. We, we, we've we had our <laughs> shares of arguments and disagreements and you name it. But uh, other than my dad, I have not learned from anybody else the amount that I've learned from him on hunting and hounds yeah. through the whole years. He's been the biggest mentor for me other than like my dad, but my dad, you know, I was raised in his house. So. Yeah. Well, that's cool. I hope you guys have a good hunt. Well, I, you'll have to let me know how. You goes. know what, uh, Jason, the worst yeah. day of hunting is better than the best day at home. <laughs> that's the truth. <laughs> 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 well, I hope you guys have some luck tomorrow. Don't don't make it too hard on it. All right. Sounds good, Jason. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thanks for coming on, Alvin. All we right. really appreciate it. You're welcome.